What is up, folks? It's the Emulsion Podcast, hosted by chef and media producer Justin Kana. That's me. The Emulsion is a result of my desire to educate, share, and personally keep myself up to date on stories stirring up the restaurant industry. I also sit down and interview remarkable professionals that are making exciting moves in their own unique and creative ways. Fine dining, chef swaps, new gear, critiques, professional performance, balance, hospitality, as well as the occasional rabbit hole are all just a few of the topics we get into here. But the goal, of course, being that you take off your headphones or get out of your car feeling smarter more inspired or more connected than when you pressed play. Where is the long ad read? You will not find that here because the growing gang of amazing folks on Patreon make it possible for me to hit the publish button every single Thursday and I'm eternally grateful for their support. But more on that after the show. Greetings everyone. Welcome back to another episode. It is so great to have you here. If you're new here, I'm all about respecting your time and distilling all of the industry happening. So let's cut right to the chase, shall we? Headlines this week. We're going to start with the news that's semi-affecting my city here in Seattle, Heston Q, a company that we've mentioned here on the show before, of course, known for their smart induction cooktops and the saute pans with the Bluetooth logos on them, and then a smartphone app that's chock full of recipes taught to you by uh, my old sous chef and uh, Boku's Door competitor, Phil Tessier, has laid off almost 40% of its staff. So from my understanding of the news, they spent a lot of resources in product development and strategic integrations recently, and they finally feel like they're in a comfortable place in the market. And so they don't really need the same kind of staff anymore. The article saying, quote, the bulk of the cuts will come in engineering and culinary culinary slash recipe development with a company CEO Stanley Chang sees a product that's already in good shape. In addition to the layoffs, some of the company's founders have left, like head of culinary Phil Tessier, or are transitioning from full-time to consulting capacities, such as the manning, managing director, Christoph Mills. In a related move, the company has tasked former VP of Hardware for Innova Culinary, John Van Den Nguyen Huizen, to lead the charge on the newly formed Heston Q, end quote. That is a very long last name. And this isn't, in any capacity, a hit piece. I'm not knocking Heston for making layoffs. If anything, the article sums it up really cleanly by basically saying that Heston has now effectively made itself more lean, they have a product that people love, and now their focus is entering new markets and forging partnerships with larger brands that they can now integrate with the products that they already uh, are working with. So it's definitely got me wondering what Phil Tessier is doing now, though. I got to get that guy on the show next time I'm in California, if he is indeed still there. The last time I saw him was at Feast Portland back in uh, September. It was uh, great to catch up with that guy for a little bit. Uh, my friend Greg Backstrom has announced and now opened his second restaurant in Brooklyn. It's called Maison Yaki, which literally translates to house grill in two separate languages. So Maison, French house, and Yaki, Japanese grill. So that's effectively what it is. It's a fusion of his two loves, yakitori and fr- like classic Escoffier style French food. The article saying, quote, so he faced the same problem that other chefs face when trying to update French recipes that are both esteemed and also a little frumpy. How do you stay true to the spirit and history of that food while turning it into the kind of shareable and, yes, affordable food that people might actually want to eat in 2019? And then this is switching to Greg. He says, quote, I didn't want it to be like French tapas or obnoxious small plates, Uh, but how do you serve two ounces of real dry-aged ribeye without it seeming silly on a plate, end quote. And then back to the article here, quote, the answer, the answer as Backstrom saw it was to embrace some ideas from the yakitori restaurants he loves, end quote. So what's on the menu? Uh, Some of the things that the article presents are tempura frog legs provencal, also escargots in shiso butter, as well as charcoal grilled skewers like lobster with sauce americaine, and chicken breast finished with sauce alamand, which is classically a light sauce thickened with roux and fortified with eggs. I think he just posted today on his Instagram, or was it maybe yesterday, like green beans, almondine. Um, Yeah, it's like super classic, uh, but in the style that is just, you can order a full table of it, which I think is what he's going for. So the restaurant itself has 52 seats. That's one less seat than Olmstead. And there's a backyard garden just like Olmstead. Nothing on the food menu is more than $9. Again, making it super easy for you to order a full table full of food. Cocktails are fitting to be great with some of the staff migration happening from Olmstead. And overall, I'm just stoked to see this vision come to life. It's an incredible example of someone who is self aware enough to know the food that he wants to cook and the food that he can be very excited to serve every single day, regardless of what people assume he's going to 
going to cook based on his background while also having this incredible feel on the pulse of what people actually want to eat. So I personally can't wait to go to a Mason Yaki next time in I'm in New York City, and I wish that team the best of luck. It's like this awesome fusion between Monsieur Benjamin in San Francisco and Yardbird in Hong Kong, which are two of my all-time favorite places to go hang out and drink and eat. So um, next up, there's a fantastic video link down below from one of my new favorite YouTubers, James Hoffman. He just passed the 50,000 subscriber mark, and he's all about coffee. Uh, those of you that have been following on Twitter know that him and I had a little uh, exchange where I shared this video, and he told me uh, you can totally cover it on the podcast. So it's no shocker that I'm into the coffee style content, but he also does things like gear reviews and industry news, uh, and he's got one of the most relaxing voices I've ever heard. And this video that I linked up is called, quote, what no one tells you about learning to taste end quote. And I'm actually not going to spoil this one. I would rather you go watch for yourself after you finish with this episode. Uh, Open it in another tab. Don't leave here just yet. It's only three minutes long. But as someone who grew up eating shitty fast food and things like frozen dinners, and then finally feeling like I grew up eating out in New York City for the two years that I was there, this definitely, definitely hit home. And I really, really hope you enjoy it if you get a chance to listen to it. Next up, I'm kind of indifferent on this one. Vox put out a piece called, quote, the best $20,000 I ever spent, Starbucks every day of my adult life, end quote. And like a freaking schmuck, I clicked on it. And did it completely mislead me? No, the it's not lying. In the 12 years that this author has been going to Starbucks, spending around $5 a day for 300 days a year, that amounts to around $20,000. But she does this weird weaving of millennial life into this article, talking about uh, taking a pay cut to go work for a more fulfilling job and not aspiring to all the material things that our parents' generation aspire to. And even talking about like how Howard Schultz is running for president and white privilege and the scandal with those two black men who got kicked out of that Starbucks. Uh, And there's a lot wrapped up in this story. And I don't necessarily think it tells you anything you didn't know. I just think it's a remarkably good time capsule that we could effectively show our kids and be like, when I was your age, kind of thing. Do you feel me? Friend of the show on Instagram sent this over. Shout out to Gigi. This is a hidden restaurant in Maine. Have you guys seen this? It's called the Lost Kitchen. And in order to get a table, you have to send a postcard. Yes, like a physical piece of paper through real physical mail. And even then, it's not guaranteed. So it's specifically in Freedom, Maine, where, quote, you can count on the buildings. You can count the buildings on one hand. There's a general store, a gas station, a post office, and the Lost Kitchen itself in an 1834 mill building perched over a street. The other stats on this place, the kitchen is helmed by Freedom native Aaron French. It's an all-female staff where they do one seating per night of just eight tables. And a little bit more about that postcard thing, the tables for summer open on April 1st, so your card has to be postmarked between April 1st and April 10th to get a table for the entire summer, and they receive 20,000 postcards this year, which is just, I don't even know what that looks like. Like, Have you seen those uh, graphics where they show like what a million dollars uh, per Printed money looks like, and then they show what a billion dollars looks like. What does 20,000 postcards look like? That'd be an interesting uh, thing to see. I'm sure they have a photo somewhere, but this article doesn't really explain what happens next, so I did some digging. Apparently, they call people and let them know if they get a spot, so if you send your postcard in, the timing's right, they'll call you, and then I'm not 100% sure what happens after that. Do they offer a date and see if people are available? I mean, listen, I get it. It's exclusive. It's a lottery. It's exciting if you get a call, but man, that makes my head turn and hurt thinking about coordinating all of those logistics, but then again, someone else probably looks at my events and gets stressed out thinking about doing tasting menus because they're like, how do you do multiple dishes and accommodate allergies? Like that seems like so hard. So who am I to judge? But overall, I'm just putting this on your radar to show that there are fun ways to run your business. I can only imagine how excited the staff of the Lost Kitchen gets during those two weeks in April when all the postcards are just pouring in. And it's like their tradition, right? So it's okay to do something a little unconventional because that's ultimately what probably is a big contributing factor to them getting all of this press, right? Like I run my business differently. Uh, That's a fun story for you as a press media outlet to cover. Do you want to come give me uh, press? See how those uh, cycles work? 
Uh, speaking of people doing media, I'm a little late to the party on covering this story, apparently. This is actually a update from a 2018 article, but uh, I still thought it was kind of cool, and it resurfaced because uh, it last, uh, when, I br- when I tagged this, it shows you how behind I am on this podcast. When I bookmarked this article, it was right around uh, April 1st, so this was right when they were anticipating to get all the postcards uh, for summer of this year. So sorry I didn't cover it uh, early enough for any of you folks to get your postcards sent in, but if any of you know anything about this restaurant or have friends that work there, I'd be curious to hear about what that kitchen culture is like. Um, I would challenge you with that question today. Feel free to let me know in the comments uh, if if there's anything that makes your business, if you are a business owner, stand out from the crowd. I know that this is like maybe they are doing, uh, I mean, there's enough people in the U.S. who are doing unique uh, single seating tasting menu style things, but none of them are taking uh, postcard reservations from what I know. So uh, yeah, let me know in the comments if you got something to share or a breakthrough that you've just made where it's like, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do this little part differently. I'd be curious. Uh, to to hear uh, what you're thinking about lately. Uh, Milk Bar has changed the name of its signature crack pie to Milk Bar Pie, and the internet had some thoughts to share. So this eater piece actually catalogs a number of places with quote-unquote crack named menu items, and they admit to using the term themselves to describe certain dishes or meals. This is Eater uh, has used uh, crack to describe things in the past. But on the pie, Christina Tosi saying, quote, our mission after all is to spread joy and inspire celebration, and the name Crack Pie falls short of this mission, end quote. And then Eater in the article saying, quote, there's little ownership for the pain that profiting off the word crack may have caused or acknowledgement that the pie's edgy drug referencing name was made more palatable when attached to the face of a Midwestern born white woman, end quote. The article continuing to say, quote, calling something crack at its heart is an exercise in making fun of topics that are inherently unfunny. Addiction, poverty, and institutional racism. The winking reference glosses over the fact that because of the war on drugs, the U.S. incarcerated poor, primarily black crack cocaine users at higher rates with harsher sentences than their white powdered cocaine using counterparts. That resulted in a generational issue that still impacts black communities, end quote. And also saying that calling something crack essentially shows, quote, how out of touch and callously classist food culture has become, end quote. That's a lot of shots fired there, and in all honesty, this piece has enough to unpack itself. It goes very in depth, uh, and it's talking about things that I like. I could have absolutely made this a main story, but I've chosen it to keep it a headline because I think the takeaways are simple. Right? Listen to my episode about Solejo and the language that she won't be using in her food writing. So I go more in depth about why one of the most respected voices in food today is thinking about what language she's going to use to describe food and why that's so important. And then the other takeaway should be more of a macro principle of kitchen language, right? So to me, I think it's a little bit simple. We know that half the reason most of us got into this industry is because we don't want a desk job, right? We don't want to have three HR managers breathing down our necks and checking our emails, right? We have quirky senses of humor. We kind of like the abuse sometimes. When you when you get a thick skin, making jokes about topics that have weight to them don't seem so bad, right? And looking at any of the stories that we've covered over the, over the past 10 months of this show, I think that's kind of evident. And all the people who get these allegations pressed on them, uh, the fact that the job pool now has a ranking system of restaurants to work for, we covered that a couple weeks ago. And I mean, hell, you probably have a sizable target market of people who you want to come eat at your restaurant that live in the HR corporate system every day of their work lives. And what you, one of you might look to as a simple joke or a jest, that can end up rippling out way further than you intended. So you've effectively got two choices. You can either keep doing the pirate ship thing, right? No one's going to stop you. But then you can't expect to be thrust into the limelight where you want to be associated with people and organizations that have more at stake than just your sense of humor, right? I mean, listen, I love kitchen culture. I really, really do. But this is kind of a shining example of a kitchen joke that saw the light of day and not everyone is as keen on it as we are. So do you have thoughts on the name change? Do you um, have people that uh, take it the other way and were offended from the beginning? Do you think that it's uh, something that's just been taken uh, a little bit too far uh, out of context or people a little bit too social justice lately? Is it a long time coming and it should have never happened? I'm really curious to hear 
hear your thoughts on this um, because, like I said, Eater does a really great job of giving the history on why it is such a big deal and why it does impact so many people um, and why these things can be so contextual. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. So tweet at me or let me know down low in the comments, please. Last up, headline style, Time put out its list of 100 most influential people of the year. And on the list from the food sector are Samin Nosrat of, of course, Netflix and cookbook fame, Massimo Bottura, and the infamous Chrissy Teigen, who Eric Repair actually has praised for her quote-unquote truly excellent cooking. Huh. Who knew Eric Repair and Chrissy Teigen were homies? But it's always great to see new and old faces being recognized for their impact on the world. Of course, that one cover a couple years ago, do you guys remember that? Where it was David Chang, Rene Redzepi, and Alex Atala all on the cover of that? That was a really, really cool uh, acknowledgement for the chef space. Man, good times. Uh, all right, massive thanks time. You folks are seriously the best. I had a bit of a hiccup on some invoices over the past few weeks, and the Patreon fam made it so that I can continue to do what I do. Honestly, not even for me. Like I'm, I'm, I'm more or less okay. I'm talking about like paying Joe, paying for my website, paying for all those services that I'm subscribed to to help me make content. And it's honestly such a, a lifted burden off of my shoulders to have your support, and it really, really means a lot. So thank you if you're part of that support. If you want to learn more about how you can support the show and get your name shouted out as well as a thank you. Uh, links for that are down low in the description. Speaking of shout outs this week, we have Alexander H, Adam W, Anthony G, all f awesome folks who have either started contributing this month or even actually edited their pledges uh, to go higher this month. So uh, really, really awesome stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone on Patreon. Today's beverage. It is my day off. I'm not supposed to be shooting this. I am uh, very, very behind uh, on all of my content, so I'm kind of working on my day off uh, today. I am deciding to crack open a beer because I'm going to dinner in about two hours at Conversation. Shout out to... Uh Everybody who listened to that and has been showing them some love uh, on Instagram as they start to open. Um, but yeah, it's my day off. So I'm having a, uh, what is this? This is in my fridge. Deschutes Fresh Squeezed IPA, born in Oregon. I don't remember why I have this. It is a 6.4% alcohol, um, juicy citrus and grapefruit flavor profile. Uh, Citra Mosaic hops were squeezed straight into the bottle. Um says worth sharing. I don't think I've have a, had a beer from these guys before. They're from Bend, Oregon. And this is definitely an expired beer. But it is what it is. That says, shows you how good I am at uh, going through alcohol here, here in my household. So if you are in the mood for sharing a beer with me, I will ask you to pause this podcast now. Go grab a beer. Pausing. Okay. Did you crack it open? Okay. Cheers. Clink. Uh, Sunday. Cold beer, sun's out, no complaints. Main story time. Food and Wine has announced their list of best new chefs of 2019. So I'm going to do a quickie rundown for you here. Congrats to Kwame Onuwachi. That's crazy timing, huh? Misty Norris, uh, Mitsuko Soma from right here in Seattle. Matthew Kamerer, Knight Yun, Carolyn Glover, Pax Carabayo Mole, uh, Jung Yoon Park, Brandon Go, Brian Furman. Food and Wine saying in their curation of this list that they, quote, encountered chefs wading into the ever more intimate, deep, committing to the detail of work cuisine rooted in an identity, choosing always to take the long way home, end quote. And I had to ask myself, as with most lists like this, and another one that I'm going to jump back to into in a second, how does it stand up over time? How good is their, quote unquote, best radar. So I went back five years to see what the list from 2014 looked like. This is just me nerding out and just trying to check like they gave stuff out in 2014. Are they still killing it today? And you've got chefs like Justin Yu from Oxheart, Mac Ocarino, Matt Ocarino from SPQR, Dave Barron from Dialogue was on the list all those years back then, Ari Tamor from Alma in LA, and the chef duo from Ox in Portland. And all of those places are still around. And yes, Alma closed and then reopened, but you feel me. And the chefs are arguably more prolific now from when they got the award. And so am I saying getting this award cements your success for the next half? decade? Absolutely not. But is there an element of the other awards coinciding with chefs on this list at the same time? Also, yes. But I guess what I'm trying to say, not tiptoe around here, is the dichotomy of the, like, of the, it's the dichotomy that the diversity of this list implies. Like, on one hand, 
There are two less white males on this list than there were in 2014. Things haven't changed that much, but they make it a point to literally point out the fact that, hey guys, look, our list is diverse. The article saying, quote, this is what food looks like right now at the edge of a decade of transformation in American restaurants, an age in which fine dining loosened up in which the food world recognized the limitations of a Eurocentric culture and came to understand what was missing without kimchi, nonprick, and jerk, in which critics wondered blindly where all the women and people of color were hiding and then found them in plain sight, aprons knotted, heads down, sometimes twice as good, but half as seen. It was a decade that recognized far too late that professional kitchens weren't always fair places or healthy places or safe places and began the work for transforming itself. And so here we are at the tail of one decade and the head of another, and this one more thrilling, more radical, and more inclusive for its spirit of revolution, and because of that, infinitely more delicious, end quote. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that because it totally contradicts my feeling about merit above all, right? And treating everyone with the same measuring stick, regardless of the food that you're cooking, right? Flavor and execution, that's my jam. But on another hand, with everyone suggesting that a possible solution is just more representation in critics, maybe it's smart to go after them. And that quote that I just said, calling them, quote unquote, blind, right? So if you want more people to appreciate Vietnamese food, you should put people in place who have an understanding of Vietnamese food to rate those. And does that mean that the person has to be of that heritage? I don't necessarily think so. I think that 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 you're you're shooting yourself in the foot by making those kinds of comments. So I don't know, man. I, it, it's an, in no way am I d- diminishing the class of 2019 here. It's absolutely well deserved. I mean, hell, I'm not on this list, right? And I don't think they put anyone on this list just to check the box and you know make sure we got another female on the list or quote, oh shit, we got to have someone that cooks Korean food on here. No, I don't think that's the case. I just think, and this is from one guy's perspective, that we've reached a point where, in a myriad of cities. In the U.S., you can get a lot more than a cheeseburger or a steak or a pizza or old school French food if you're wanting to go out to dinner. And most of us are aware of that, right? It's pretty obvious by the amount of chefs who used to be proud of their old school French food now reaching for gochujang and fish sauce and arepas, right? How? So my question is, how far does it have to go to feel balanced, right? I flash back to the story that I covered of Time's Most Influential People, and the headline from Grub Street mentioned Chrissy Teigen and Samin Nosrat, but it didn't mention Massimo Boutura in the headline. So what prompted that decision? Is it because Massimo is a Eurocentric white male who already gets enough coverage and he's already got his own episode on Netflix? Because Samin has four episodes on Netflix of her own show, and she constantly gets coverage from a myriad of food outlets. So... Maybe this is a rhetorical question, but what are we really shooting for here? That's like my my main question. If it's true, if it's equality, true equality, what is that based off of? And when is it enough? Again, maybe it's because I'm so team human and I want to see everyone win if their work is good enough. And that's it, it's so hard for me to see this pendulum swing happening where it's going the other way, right? I'm, I'm all for recognizing the past and realizing that it hasn't always been this way and giving people some well-deserved spotlight time. But I get frustrated when I see people not being included in the headline for the fear of being backlashed. An article comes out that says this year's World 50 Best had too many males or last year's Michigan guide in XYZ city was too white. And then everyone just headline reads and thinks, oh, we're not going to do that. We're going to be more diverse this year. Why? The question is why? Pick the best restaurant by whatever metrics you set and then celebrate the team behind them. I wish it could just be as cut and dry as that. That's that's what I want more of. Do, don't do things to appeal to certain people who get angry on Twitter or give people what you think they want to hear. That's that quote, right? The easiest way to fail is to try and please everyone. And I get frustrated when I see the deliberate hiding of white males on certain lists or awards because it's effectively fighting fire with fire. An eye for the eye makes the whole world blind, right? We all know that quote. People of color and different racial and cultural backgrounds and genders and sexual orientations, they aren't going to reach this place of supposed equality if they continue to get satisfaction from this like, "Eh, yeah, I love how few white people are on this list kind of thing. Like, I love this all-female award thing. 
I don't know why I just uh, did that voice. I don't know. If you flip it around, it sounds just as bad, right? If you were to say, like, I love how few Indian people are on this list. I love this all-male award, right? Doesn't that sound horrible? It's like it's projecting the hate you feel with more hate. And you can't fight hate with hate. You, you, you can be proud when you see the love. You can show people love, but you can truly like you can truly appreciate what certain people are doing and understand that it's not to your detriment when someone else wins. But man, I apologize if that got a little too woo-woo and mushy for you folks, but after almost 100 episodes of this show and covering stories like this, I've really formed some strong opinions, and I want to plant my flag in the ground here and go on the record uh, with some of this stuff. I actually had a great conversation with at RalphieFresh23 on Twitter about my Kwame story a few days ago, and I actually really love the dialogue that we got into. So if you folks want to chat more about this, uh, clearly um, I have some thoughts to share, but I'm also super, super open to uh, getting to different perspectives because I see what the news outlets put out and then I also see uh, people who are just super head down working, getting knowledge for their work. And then there's, you know, people who just have an opinion and want to see written, things written in a certain way. Um, and again, this is not me like denying that I don't think racism exists or I don't think that the, all the opportunities are fair to everyone right now. Um, yeah, just some of these like rhetorical questions that I'd love to, uh, chat through further and make them not so rhetorical where we actually get into it. So please jump into the comments or tweet at me. I'm at Justin, Con at Justin underscore Kana over there. And I would love to learn your perspective or learn about your feelings and your thoughts and, and hear a little bit more about where we're at as an industry right now from your perspective. And I know it's never going to be perfect because your definition of perfect and my definition of perfect are different, but I think it's important to talk about. So I want to pass the question off to you here with so much built up frustration and emotions about the absolutely justified feeling of being dwarfed by others because of other people's culture. My question is, how far does the pendulum have to swing in the other direction before we feel like we've hit center, right? Was was food and wine in the right to call attention to the diversity in their list? Or do we still have a long ways to go? Please let me know. All right, moving on. You folks, as your friend, your host with the most, your internet homie, I would advise you to not open a restaurant whose name starts with the word lucky. We chatted through Lucky Cricket. That didn't get received all that well. I've got an article linked up down below about Gordon Ramsay's restaurant, Lucky Cat. And now there's this massive controversy that just exploded on Twitter over this place in New York called Lucky Lee's. Noticing a pattern here. Where in the world do we begin? Let's start with Lucky Cat because that was a rather quick recap. As you could have probably guessed, Gordon Ramsay opened up a place in London with items uh, at the media preview that included, quote, a mini Wagyu pastrami burger with an Asian chili jam an Otoro fatty tuna, English asparagus, and smoked ponzu emulsion, and smoked duck breast with plum, end quote. So quickie recap on what happened at this media thing and why uh, the article surfaced in the first place. So this restaurant apparently doesn't have any Asian cooks on staff. Uh, the head chef has an Asian wife, and the food critic who kind of blasted him, uh, she is East Asian. Her name is Angela Wee, H-U-I. And he, she has accused him of uh, having a token wife, a Asian token wife. Uh, also, Gordon Ramsay has come out on Instagram defending his practices, saying, quote, it is fine to not like my food, but prejudice and insults are not welcome, end quote. One quoted guy on Twitter in the article named George Chen saying, quote, is the famous chef going to curse at his white cooks in Asian or what? Every chef has a right to interpret another cuisine, but the integrity and culture, read authenticity, albeit I hate that term, needs to be studied in depth and not whitewashed for marketing purposes, end quote. Okay, okay, okay. So. I personally had to do a little bit more digging and reading on this because CNN was this CNN clearly wrote this as a hit piece uh, for Gordon. I mean, the title of the article says cultural appropriation in it, but I got to say, I did my best to see where his side could have been appreciated, but it's definitely a white dude claiming to be serving authentic things when he's clearly not. And I think that's part of the problem. And that's where the issue is, right? Like take this other dish I found on their Instagram, Orkney scallop with yuzu and sweet corn hot sauce, finger lime, and wasabi leaves. 
And like, if you saw that on a menu of a gastro pub in your downtown area, wherever, wherever that is, you'd be like, okay, cool. That kind of makes sense. But then if the server walked over to you and said what this press release says, which is quote, the new restaurant highlights Gordon Ramsay's restaurants, continued innovation and creativity, and is set to become the go-to destination for exquisite, authentic Asian cuisine and the culture in the heart of Mayfair, thriving on an ethos of respect and passion that is channeled into every dish, end quote. You might look up at that server giving you that spiel and you'll be like, "Eh, I don't know about that, right? So the nail that he hit on the head was this same continued issue we've continued to see. Uh, Like I visit, look guys, I've visited this exotic location before. I see bits and bobs that I can take from that culture, whether it's popular ingredients or new techniques or flavor combinations or a way to present things. And I'm going to claim that and I'm doing it justice by serving it at a massive markup. And those three things together, right, the the lack of humility and appreciation partnered with the big business e I'm going to profit off of you kind of feeling makes people who truly appreciate it hate you. And that's another part of the problem, right? So I think about a restaurant that I've talked about before on the show here, State Bird Provisions in San Francisco. Their service is clearly a play on dim sum service. They're not hiding behind it. They bring trays and carts around with food. You pick what you want. They mark up the sheet on your table. It's fun. And in no way have they ever said that they are new dim sum or authentic Chinese service, right? The same goes for the story that we just covered about Mason Yaki. Greg Greg Backstrom isn't claiming to be authentically anything. He's just cooking food he's excited about. And it just happens to be inspired by somewhere other than Brooklyn. And I feel like that other article... um, about Lucky Lee's that I also have linked up down below talks about it really well. The author actually breaking down uh, how it it didn't have to go wrong. It could have gone right. Opening a place called Lucky Lee's where it's, you know, attempting to do take inspiration from another culture and uh, make it your own. It could have gone right. And the author saying, quote, Let's look at the cycle of appropriation that's all too common in restaurants. Step one, the owner doesn't get it. The business owner is seemingly lazy about learning the historical context and cultural background of the very food he or she plans to sell. Diners seem equally uninterested in the understanding of the context and culture of the restaurant, which just reinforces stereotypes. Step two, the owner makes excuses. When questioned, the owner reveals this lack of understanding while marketing their business. How is it breaking how it is breaking the mold or quote unquote elevating the food, relying on already debunked and debasing stereotypes of the cuisine. There might even be claims of being the torchbearer of quote unquote authenticity, whatever the capacity. Again, a nod to this Gordon Ramsay piece. Step three, the community pushes back and the owner makes a non-apology. The un- underrepresented community that r- expresses resistance to this profiteering is gaslit with indirect straw man arguments. The owner spouts archetypal, sorry if you were offended lines or issues a new age, we are about inclusivity, non-apology, meant to explain away all indiscretion and minimize concerns of the accosted community, end quote. And I'm personally looking to identify those glaring red flags and make sure that you and I both become aware of them so that we can be more thoughtful in our marketing and presentation. This community is truly global. We are on all six continents, believe it or not. And I say six because no one is officially registered a podcast download from Antarctica yet. I just checked that. So massive props to the first person uh, to download the Emulsion podcast from Antarctica. But that means that if you're from Australia and you trained in Japan and because you just in your heart of hearts love Japanese food or say, for example, you're Korean American, but you put in your dues at Alex Stupak's place and now you're super poised to make amazing Korean slash Mexican tacos or even someone like me, right? A guy who grew up in the Midwest, my dad's from India, and all my training is in modern American and French and Scandinavian food. What are people like us supposed to do? to make sure that we don't have a huge backlash. And I would like to think that if you listen to this show, your head is screwed on and you're in a pretty good place. But uh, like, you're not going to go off and open your Italian slash Thai concept where you take old school Italian pasta dishes and make them in a walk and claim to be authentically either of those, right? But I think... When you're able to understand the rules, then you're able to break them. That's a pretty age-old quote. You can evolve, you can try new things, but if you know where you came from and you acknowledge those that have come before you, I think you're probably going to be okay. And I've been watching street food on Netflix over the past few days, like an episode a day, basically, while I eat dinner. And in addition to being a great show... 
I feel like I learn things every single episode. It actually shows you that even the traditions stem from bastardizing other things and tweaking influences from all over. And I think the problem now is that there's so much globalization and ideas can spread so fast that innovation occurs in shorter spans of time, right? And that's easier to recognize because we can literally remember the beginning and the middle and the end, right? So we take things that are literally less than 100 years old and we like to think of them as these age-old things that have been around forever when that's really not the case. And I think it ultimately comes down to an ego thing. I think people want the clout that comes along with being the brainchild of something. And sometimes that comes at the expense of giving credit where credit is due. And I'll, of course, leave it to, to you to do your own reading. If you want to dive deeper into this story, you know where those links are. I don't got to tell you. You're not new around here. Um, but yeah, if you have thoughts to share on this um, opening places with a name that isn't always respectful of the culture that you're um, executing the food under. If you're under that umbrella, are you walking in there with muddy shoes and getting the floor all dirty and and breaking all the china in the place? Or are you uh, being a nice uh, guest and, and, and respecting things? I'm not sure. Some people aren't like us, I guess. All right, next up, I was going to do my cliche, here's a headline, read more if you want on this one, but you folks got to indulge me here a little because Grub Street came out with a piece on Paul LeBrant, and I have to dive deeper on it because he was so quintessentially inspirational, not just for me when I was starting off, but I distinctly remember uh, Chef David Breeden, who was the chef de cuisine of French Laundry, getting uh, Paul LeBrant's book, and he was just gushing over it. He was so unapologetically uh, creative. I think that, uh, that that's attractive to a lot of people, uh, diners and chefs alike. And I had the pleasure of having a fantastic meal at Cortone with Anna uh, way back in the day. It was actually a funny story about us trying to order wine pairings at that meal when both of us weren't 21 yet, but that's for another podcast. So this article is focused on giving us a bit of an update on Paul Quoting him from the end of his documentary, quote, I will not be happy until I achieve what I came to this country to achieve, end quote. And then the article saying, quote, if the filmmakers shot a sequel now, the subtitle might be what happened, end quote. So it catalogs the various pop-ups he's been doing, consulting on menus and restaurants under his company uh, called Crumpet. His history with uh, Drew Nieperent and how they used to lose, quote, $1,000 a day for four years, end quote, at Cortone. Uh, his commonality with Chef Wiley Dufresne, who apparently also struggled with finances and being an ambitious mover and shaker, and a couple more things. So it's a really good recap of where Paul LeBrant is at and kind of cataloging between the documentary and now. Um, and it actually has a bit of a melancholy undertone to it. Uh, LeBrant saying, quote, I've been cooking since I was 15 in the top restaurants. It's a habit and addiction to work. I don't know anything else, end quote. This article also references this really fascinating timing that also happened with chefs like Laurent Gras. Quote, in 2017, LeBrant told Eater that restaurant investors were risk averse because of the then recent presidential election and the shaky stock market. Any investor partnering on an upscale dining eatery with high food and labor costs is making a big bet, particularly in this town where 80% of restaurants close in their first five years of business. End quote. So Paul LeBrant, as a TLDR for this article, is effectively a toke for hire. This is the article's where it's not mine. And I think that's totally fine, right? After thinking about this for a while, uh, after my personal perspective of seeing chefs like Laurent Gras and Paul go through these struggles and deal with these financial obstacles, it really pushed me into creating content and working on finding a way to diversify my skills outside of just being solid in the kitchen. And in no way am I comparing myself to Paul, but you get what I mean. He's effectively like, I have this lane that I play in and I'm really freaking good at it, but the question becomes, where do we go from here? And that's almost the beauty of this article is that it doesn't lay out this grand master plan. It's basically like, here's what Paul LeBrand is up to the end. So overall, just an overall nerd out piece for me. I respect the guy a lot. I wish him the best. Paul, if you're ever listening to this and you would be interested, I would love to interview you for the show. But yeah, that's more or less what I've got to say on that. Does anybody have an opinion or has done a uh, dinner or worked for Paul in the past few years? I'd be curious to see um, where he's at because he was so 
traditionally French minded, uh, but also at the same time. So as I said earlier, unapologetically creative talking about serving like salt ice creams and, uh, lots of blood and monochromatic dishes and different, uh, textures and temperatures that you wouldn't really expect. Uh, and for someone like me who was super, you know, I loved Linnea and Grant Ackett's and, and all of that. Um, that was very, very inspiring, but it's, uh, it's the second movie, right, in the trilogy, where, like, the first movie is, like, a little bit of origin story, see him defeat the bad guy, see some success, and then the second movie is supposed to be a little bit more of, like, darker, right? And I hope, I, I sincerely hope we see uh, Paul LeBrant rise from the ashes and uh, do something exciting, because we're, oh, I think a lot of us are rooting for you, man. So that's, that's all I have to say on that. Uh, I actually do have a surprise secret link down low in the description, or it's on my site uh, in the show notes for you folks. It's uh, the first time I've done a secret link on the show. Um, It's more for anyone on the service side of things. I took a read through it, and I decided it would actually be a good piece for my business partner and I to make a separate video on together. So Jade and I will probably chat through that someday. Oh, someday. Just add it to the list, huh? I'm so, so behind on videos right now, folks. It's so bad. Uh, But I'm busy working on not video things, so I can't help it. I'm getting closer, though. Uh, I'm almost caught up. I'm just letting you know the hustle is real right now. I have a list. I just got to start checking the boxes, checking the boxes. Normally, this is where I transition into direct answer, where you folks will send me a question and I will try to answer in hopes to help the greater good. But I have a couple of questions I was going to pull from, but I would rather just include them on episode 100. So it's more of like a fun Q&A podcast related uh, bonanza. So um, most of you have been holding out on the uh, anchor messages. So I would push you, especially if you're listening this far into the show, to go ahead and check that video out. It's the first link in the show notes here where you can go ahead and actually be featured on this podcast. You can hear your voice on the Emulsion podcast and all the other people in all of their six continents uh, will hear your message or you know, you can tell me what your thoughts are on on the show lately or uh, tell me something that you didn't like, or we can get into a little bit of a conversation. Um, so if you do have a question, uh, that you're interested in getting answered, please either send it to me in an email or even better, give me an anchor voice message. So you and I can both have our voices on episode 100 of the emulsion. Uh, All right, so next up is a segment that I call Suit Up. It is kind of where I talk about a little uh, business happenings that's been going on uh, as a entrepreneur myself uh, with me and my co-founder of Voyager's Table. So last week, we actually had the launch of our Voyage Dinners. That's the pop-ups that I was planning on launching. We were going to do tickets. We were going to do it constantly roving around, constantly changing seasonal menu. And we actually had a weirdly profound realization after that first dinner. We did like this half and half mix of invitees and paid people and the venue was generously sponsored and the wine was donated and I got to do these really fun presentations with the food and everyone was super happy. But then we realized after the dinner, we should make these a marketing opportunity. We shouldn't be ch- chasing these for profit. So effectively, and this is like the lesson that the the nugget of lessons that I'm going to try to share here is we're going to pivot these to think less about profitability and more about how can we stimulate meaningful connection at these dinners? How can we be less focused on selling people on a ticket and be more focused on creating just a fantastic vibe that people want to come hang out at? And how do we blow people's minds with hospitality and food and being around a shared table so that we effectively become the first thing that comes to mind when someone says, I want to do a dinner, right? So that's the strategy, and we were able to glean that from just one of the dinners, and I couldn't be more excited about it. So I was constantly grappling with staffing and ingredient costs to make sure that I kept it at that like 10 to 15% profit margin, but at the end of the day, if we can accept that we're just going to break even, and then it leads to a couple of other like four or five figure contracts later in the year with someone that we decide to invite as a new client, that's a a way better use of our time rather than pushing to make like $250 profit on $2,000. $2,500 $2,500 in revenue. Uh, okay, so suit up. I really like that segment. I think that there's more value in Jade and I doing some sort of our own show, maybe not um, always business related, but I think that documenting our journey with Voyager's Table should live on Voyager's Table's uh, YouTube channel and Instagram. 
And uh, that's kind of like a realization that I came to after um, putting in some thought time around adding different segments to the show. And as I'm thinking about season two that I'm going to talk about in a second here, um, I told myself I was going to do six episodes with Suit Up in it, but I think this is a really nice uh, kind of end cap to this series. If you guys are interested in more of this business chat, um, I will hopefully have a link to the Voyager's Table YouTube channel that we can go into uh, soon. But I think any tips on um, event planning and event production and logistics, I think will live there. And then if I want to do any sort of pop-up chef focused information that will live on my channel. Again, I'm trying to grapple with the fact that um, I have all this media and branding experience and I want to make sure that the company stands out in its own way. And I don't want, I want it to be very clear like, oh, you hear, you see the title of a video and you're like, oh, that's probably on Justin's channel. And then if you see another title for a video, you're probably like, oh, that's probably on the Voyager's Table YouTube channel, right? Where, yes, I could technically migrate Dish of the Day over to Voyager's Table, but that's my show. I want that show, right? And in the same way, we're like, I could talk about business-related stuff with Voyager's Table on my channel. It makes a little bit more sense for that to live on the company's YouTube channel. Does that make sense? So... It's all going to come with time. We're figuring it out. Um, but I would like to kind of end cap. This is probably the last segment of Suit Up here on the show. It's been real. I uh, appreciate you guys for letting me be experimental. That's part of the reason why uh, I keep this mostly um, supporter funded so that you guys give me the freedom to try new things and experiment. Um, I'm all I, I'm all for transparency and showing you folks how the sausage is made uh, literally literally and figuratively um but yeah just an update there so if uh, you see episode 101 or 102 not have suit up you're not like what happened um so that's that that's kind of my mindset and i'm going to go more into that on episode 100 Last up in our non-industry story, for those of you that are new, I think it's important to take a break from work sometimes to get out of the kitchen or get out of the culinary school bubble and open your eyes to what's going on to the rest of the world. And this week, it's got to be the Logic and Eminem collaboration, right? It's called Homicide. The song is called Homicide. And damn, not only have I been following them both respectively, so there's like this lead up to the collaboration uh, for those of you that have seen like Eminem uh, hung out backstage with Logic for a little while. Logic was like freaking out and then he went on the H3H3 podcast and talked about it. Uh, and he's been talk- uh, Eminem shouted out that he inspired Logic on his latest album. So to see all that lead up to the collaboration is also super cool, which is like super 2019 way to think about it. But it's also, uh, the song itself is just straight fire, but it's awesome to see someone like Logic who has these goals of like, I want to work with Eminem. I want to work with Jay-Z. I only want to work with Nike on my sneaker. And if I don't get them, I'm not going to settle for someone else. I have these people in my mind that inspire me and I want to work with the best of the best. Uh, and he, he flexes on people with his work instead of swag. And it's really inspiring to see him make moves. So definitely, if you even if you don't like hip hop, um, definitely give uh, Homicide a stream on Spotify because uh, I want the Emulsion Podcast to show Logic some love. I mean, if we're being real, you've probably been bumping it for the past uh, couple couple of days anyways. Also, the uh, the React videos on YouTube to uh, people reacting to listening to that song for the first time. Who knew? There's an entirely separate genre that you and I have no, have no clue about. All right, so for those of you that have been really following along, this episode is late. For those of you that have been looking at the numbers of these episodes, uh, this is episode 98, but it's actually getting published after episode 99. I had that one with Anna already pre-edited. Shout out to everyone who's been enjoying uh, my conversation with my fiance. But yeah, like I said, I had that one already slated up to go live. Uh, But again, I'm super behind on the videos. Uh, The Chef Knife Bonanza video is behind. I'm getting behind on gearboxes being shipped out. I've uh, teased videos in Ask JK that aren't even 100% scripted yet. So I'm, I'm taking this as like... Exhale, Justin. Tackle the list. I just want a hundred episode one hundred to be amazing. I'm gonna take my time. I'm gonna make sure it's something that I'm super proud of. Uh, definitely gonna sit down and rework the way that I do the podcast for season two. Um, I'm not saying that the style of show will go away indefinitely, but damn, it took me three days to write out this script uh, between my other projects. Right, like two hours here, three hours there. 
And that's way too damn long to spend on a podcast script. Um, I actually just did a word count on this on this script, and it's six thousand words long. And yeah, that's freaking long. And I've got I know I've got quotes in here, but it, that I just copy and paste in here. But like professional writers will spend half their week writing six thousand good quality words, and I'm trying to bang it out in one day. And and no wonder I feel overwhelmed, right? So. I just need a little bit of a strategy meeting with myself. Uh, I, I I still definitely want to keep this a weekly show. I love this show so much, but maybe splitting it up, right? So it's like headlines ish towards the front of the show, where I like almost react to stories, and then I tackle a specific concept or idea or issue that's in the industry, right? Where I talk about uh, cultural appropriation for this episode, and then the next week I talk about uh, the wage gap, and then the next week I talk about writing a cookbook as a professional chef. Um, and then we do kind of like a non-industry story and maybe I answer a question, uh, but that's it because I'm noticing some overlap, right? Where I ask for questions for direct answer, but then I do an ask JK on the, on the channel. And I would rather just, uh, push people to ask their questions on YouTube. But anyways, that's just me rambling on, uh, about all the, pots that I have my hand in right now. So it can, with the goal also of making these solo episodes a little bit shorter, I think me ranting for 25 to 35 minutes ish in that range is very productive and I can get a lot of uh, ideas out into the world in that way. And then that frees up the interviews, like the 60 to 90 minute interviews to be their own style of video. And maybe those um, just are audio no we just got a dual camera set up we can't we can't do that um i mean seriously let me know your thoughts if you have any uh can't promise i'm going to listen to them but uh yeah if you are like please don't take away blank um i would love to know uh better yet leave it in the freaking audio messages because i want to hear your voice say it to my ears say it directly to my ears folks if you have feedback on how you think I can make episode uh, season two even better than season one. I would love to know. Um, so either leave me a comment if you want, tweet at me. Uh, if you're just into using your thumbs, if you're into using your face, please log on to Anchor. Super easy. Uh, search. Um, it's, in, it, it's a link. It's a link. It'll take you straight to Anchor. Um, and then that way I can hear exactly what you want to say. So as always, I really, really appreciate your attention. Uh, let's clink beers again. Cheers. If you uh, did end up opening a beer, um, please leave me your thoughts in the comments. Get some color on that like button if you're on YouTube or tweet at me if you're only on Twitter. My name is Justin Kana. Please roll the outro. We did it. You're in outro land now. Thank you so much. I appreciate your ears more than you'll ever know. Hey, by making it to the end, you're the type of person that I want to speak to directly. This little production is constantly growing. If you enjoyed this episode, if you like what I'm trying to do with this show and want to make sure more people can find us, a free way to help out that takes less than three minutes is to leave The Emulsion a great review on iTunes. If you didn't enjoy this show, please also leave a review. I'm happy to take any constructive feedback you've got. If you want to learn more about supporting this show with your hard-earned cash, patreon.com slash Justin Kana is the place to do that. I've got tiers starting at just $1 per month. Let's say you just like being involved through suggesting stories to be covered or asking questions to my interview guests. You can stay up to date by following along on Twitter or Instagram that is linked up in the description for your convenience or always available on justinkana.com. If you're on YouTube and listening, you can take this show on the go because this is available on all podcast platforms, including Spotify. And if you prefer video versions of things like my interview shows or the shorter intermezzo episodes and you're listening audio only, please check out my YouTube channel to see more of that. Now's normally where I'd say my name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one, but you've probably got another podcast episode to listen to, so I'm just gonna get out of the out of the way here. Excuse, excuse me. Pardon me.